so this sort of uh, also for Sisters, for why should we study this? Uh, and the real motivation is that, uh, as you will find, that there are. Uh, this is a slightly older uh, slide, and um, the, the semiconductor industry has progressed so much so that um, electronics has uh, become part of our lives. And as of 2014, we are supposed we had about 1.7 devices. What here is the uh, what we mean by that is that uh, we have these devices that are able to connect to an inter internet, and uh, of which 33 billion uh, devices are expected to be uh, connected to internet by 2020 by this year. This was projected. Actually, it has surpassed that. In fact, so in on average, people are seeing about four devices. Uh, cell phones, laptops, desktops, uh, and um, even uh, sometimes these new gadgets uh, that have come up as so-called watches, smart watches, and this and that. So there are many ways to connect to internet these days, and uh, and this has created enough challenges from the energy efficiency perspective and also from the um, thermal management perspective and. The hope is for this course is to address some of those uh, parts. So if we really look at um, the other end of the spectrum where when we talk about Internet connected devices, they all have to have um, some of them. At least um, if you are talking on a phone, then the data goes through a data center and the data centers are expected to consume a lot of power as well. And uh, there have been some extremely uh, bad case scenarios that have been projected, and um, but there are also some conflicting information that no, no, it's not that high of power consumption. But based on 2018, um, the each data center consumes about 200 terawatt hours of electricity. Uh, throughout the world, this is the entire global scale number, and the electricity used by ICT, which is the Information and Communication Technologies, is 2,000 terawatt hour, and the global uh, electricity demand is on the order of 20,000 uh, terawatt hour. That means uh, almost uh, we are talking about 10% being used by the ICT infrastructure itself. So that makes it a very energy intensive process um, uh, for uh, running some computers. And the reason for this boom or increase in electricity demand is that if you look at really how much was the internet traffic back in 1987, it was only ter two terabytes. In 1997, it became 60 petabytes. Uh, peta is 10 power 15. And 2080 is the exabyte, that is to 10 power 18 bytes. And now we are in so-called zettabytes in, uh, in the current state. So it is actually growing at a very exponential rate. So the number of data centers that need to be put uh, throughout the world is increasing at a very fast rate to uh, keep up with the communication demand. So, and also there are other trends, the so-called information factories. If you look at the uh, global leaders by market capitalization, that is how much they are, um, they have the market share. You see in 2002, Microsoft was the only company that is based on uh, ICT that was there. In 2007, Microsoft and AT&T were there. Well, Apple started, and in 2017, all the major, the top five companies uh, by 
market capitalization uh, are information factories. That is Apple, Alphabet is Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. They are the leaders. That means the ones who are actually uh, uh, these are the people who are actually uh, making a lot of money uh, compared to by pure revenue perspective, the energy companies do take the lead, but the, the digital technology companies are now the top money making uh, companies throughout the world. So that's the reason why this course becomes quite um, useful from the idea of thermal management. So what we focus on this is that uh, we will discuss the aspects of thermal management as as I know it, and and what what makes this uh, a relevant relevant um, course from today's perspective. So usually the temperature is um, effects are felt all the way from the transistor level and all the way to the data center level. So we will go through some uh, more items uh, very soon. Um, I will show you some some big picture items uh, soon enough, but you will find that anywhere you look into transistor level because they're at the level, the uh, fluxes are very, very high or very high fluxes are seen while at the data center level, the power is very high. And always um, there's always a need to develop new performance and compact cooling technology. So if you see the cell phones uh, 15 years back, the cell phones used to be fairly thick and the battery used to be small. Now they have expanded the phone in such a way that the battery is uh, occupying more space than the circuitry. And uh, it has become thin and it is able to do more functionality than what it used to back in uh, the back 10 to 10 15 years back so that makes the the packaging becoming extremely um important aspect of this so the next is the uh, second uh, important point to be noted is that um, no more uh, is that chip technology the primary driver for sales it is actually what is called performance per watt, which is the packaging perspective, uh, has become the more of a selling point. Chip technologies, once um, I will discuss this briefly as well, uh, there used to be scaling, uh, electrical field scaling that used to happen and that the chip technology used to be the selling point that now that I have, I can do deliver two gigahertz of speed and then three gigahertz. Now you will see that the speed has almost flat. It is almost flat and it's not because the power consumed to deliver some improved uh, frequency of switching is so high that uh, people stopped increasing the speed, but rather they are focusing on performance per package or per watt of supply power. And the revenue generated is very, very high, just purely from the management perspective. Yes, please. Hello? Was there a question, comment? Okay. Uh, no, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the the thermal management uh, revenue is very, very high these days. It, this is actually only one part of the revenue. They don't account for some of the software aspects. This is all hardware aspects. And just purely look at in, looking at the money aspect is, uh, is itself is quite high. Nowadays, data center softwares are one of the, uh, one of the uh, richest uh, growing areas of industry. Um, uh, so anyway, if you see the current uh, trend is expected to be close to 13 to 14 the billion dollars, uh, and it is still growing at a rate of 6%. So if you look at um, what is this that we are talking about is that Transistors are on the order of nanometers. 
you should the current uh, um, the current technology is at uh, nanometers. Uh, most of the devices are 10 nanometers, but you will see that they are. Uh, you will see Intel or in many of semiconductor manufacturers quoting a number called um, uh, some. Uh, this is said seven nanometer, 10 nanometer, and so on and so forth. That is the minimum feature size the transistor has. This is a very old transistor picture I have from IBM. And this is the source and this is the drain. And the distance between the two is bring as the gate. And that is the minimum feature size. And that feature size is what is called the seven nanometer technology or 10 nanometer technology. Currently, uh, the TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, what they are selling or shipping seven nanometer technology. That means it is very close to the atoms, atomic scale that now we are talking of seven nanometers. That means extremely small feature size transistors. Um, and these transistors are assembled and, and in a silicon that is essentially they are integrated because there are billions of billions of transistors. Uh, they are not individual. They all have to be connected. For the for it to work as as a single unit, they all have to be connected internally, so that they all work in unison. That that's what often referred as the silicon die. Still, at the silicon stage, silicon die stage, we can't connect it to an external world. So the power has to be somewhat specialized at the silicon die level. But once you go from silicon die and what you see often uh, that is sold in the market is this. This is the so-called package. That is the way for the silicon die to communicate with the external world. That is where, that is how the power from your wall uh, can be fed to the silicon die so that the silicon die can be uh, run as your uh, CPU. So that uh, that is the um, difference between silicon die to the package. And because the power levels have increased significantly, and you can see all the way from two to hundreds of watts, even now there are micro watts or whatever, and there are devices or sensors that have level of connectivity. Uh, they are close to hundreds or uh, hundreds of milliwatts. But nevertheless, the phones, the smartphones are on the order of two to three watts, and uh, the desktop and servers, for example, those processes consume 300, 400 watts of power. And so they, since they are dissipating that much heat, uh, they have to be mounted with a heat sink. If you take that heat sink, this processor, and put it together as a system with memory and other controller, then you either get a, a the so-called subsystem, which is uh, which consumes about uh, depending on what we are talking about, uh, can be your station uh, or a server box, and that is on the order of it consumes power on the order of five to thousands of watts or one kilowatt as well. Uh, so then if you take these n number of racks and put it in a facility, so n number of boxes and you get one rack and you take this n number of racks populated in a room that is your facility or your data center. That's where it dissipates um, very high power what you see is that the fluxes are quite high at the package level. They are not only high, but they are also non-uniform. I will discuss those aspects. And there are intricate complexities now emerging from the newer and newer technology for, by which they are enabling the performance improvement. And uh, that's the whole idea. This is a very old graph, but anyway, I will show it to, to indicate one important aspect. Um, so if you look at this, there are many curves. Uh, this green line is the number of transistors 
um, in a in a compute system uh, or a uh, or a package or a microprocessor. If you see dual core titanium, it used to have close to this uh, one millions. Now it it is in. Nevertheless, what I want to indicate is that right around 2004, the semiconductor manufacturers made a conscious decision that they will not be increasing the power or the speed. This dark blue line is the clock speed. This lighter blue line is the power consumed for the desktop segment. If you see right around 2005, because the power consumed by these processes have become extremely high to deliver the increase in the clock speed and also the thermal management was becoming challenging so putting um, liquid cooling for desktop or laptop is is not a right way of doing things so so they consciously made a decision and also there is something called leakage power that also kept uh, creeping up so this made it um, uh, one of the uh, so the 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 industry entire industry um, made a conscious effort and said that they will make a right hand turn and that's that's the idea uh, why and this is where the change in the architecture the micro architecture also happened this after that you would see that uh, people are talking about dual core multi core uh, processors and so on uh, and now we are, we are in the mini core era as well but you can see that performance per clock also flop, uh, flattened and uh, this is the so called right hand turn of the semiconductor industry is that the power became flat so the power increase from processor generation to processor generation almost remained flat it is increasing very very slow rate uh, but so that's the important trend is that the power kept constant, but the flux density and the complexities involved in the packaging uh, increased tremendously. We'll discuss some aspects. Also. So with that as a background, so what I'm planning to do in this course is to go through some aspects of how heat is generated in the package um, from a very high level uh, electrical perspective. Then how do we dissipate that heat? What are the paths by which heat can be dissipated in a given pack? And, and all the way from, we'll try to integrate some data center parts as well at the end. And my hope is that um, to bring in some of the practical aspects into this discussion so that uh, uh, we, because most of the problems that are there in electronics are not often um, discussed in our traditional heat transfer classes. It's always some sort of a heater uh, that shows up. Electronics means, okay, it is dissipating certain power, but then it is not one heater. There's so many heaters in a given motherboard. So one has to address uh, what is the influence of one heat source on the other uh, heat sources in the package. Let me see how many people have joined. Just bear with me. For a second, my panels. Okay, um, back to. Can you see my presentation again? No? I guess I didn't share it well. OK. So my coverage for this class are roughly on, on this. So today I'm going to cover the introduction basics uh, on the packages and self-heating and some how is thermal management done on uh, electronic packages or at the data center level? Then uh, spreading and construction resistance. Um, 
this is very important from a packaging perspective and uh, contact resistance. Um, pin analysis, not the traditional ones that we talk uh, in our regular mechanical engineering courses. And I'll have Professor Sripriya Ramamurthy to discuss about acoustic management and uh, natural convection and radiation in electronic packaging. Uh, very short uh, discussion on that. And force convection. Here I'll spend some time developing some core ideas on kernel function and so on. Then we talk about heat pipes and vapor chambers, phase change module metrics and so on. So the last part, I don't know if I'll have time, but I'll, I want to really spend the time to explain some data center design examples and uh, uh, design of uh, LEDs. Um, one aspect that I've been, uh, I have not touched upon is that um, all the discussions today um, that I'm planning to do is to focus on microprocessors and stuff. But realistically, um, what, when we mean electronics, it also means power electronics that are used these days in cars where there are IGBTs or wide uh, band gap devices that are used as inverters. So all the principles that is discussed here can be applied to any situation, power electronics or electronics, any uh, in many, many multiple situations. In fact, the same concepts have been exploited in other industries as well. Uh, like uh, the emerging LEDs, um, so all of them, um, because LEDs now are integrated very similar to a package. So, um, so this um, is likely to be uh, applicable to other, even though um, I won't, because I want to give a certain focus uh, uh, that um, I will focus on the processes, but I will try to highlight it if uh, it can be applied to other situations as well. Um, for example, batteries these days, battery thermal management is becoming an important aspect as well. There, the same set of principles that we are discussing um, can be easily applied and there as well. So if when we talk about thermal design, uh, one of the main things that you will see if you get a processor and you can look up any of the processors on Intel or any manufacturer, AMD or, uh, or uh, you know, Qualcomm, they all have what are called thermal design data sheets. And, and you can look up any given processor and find what is its TDP. TDP is what is called the thermal design power or sometimes referred as total design power. And this is a very important power that one has to take into account for designing or cooling a package or a micro. This thermal design power is, uh, is sort of like a standard or guideline that is given to anyone um, because AMD or Intel wants to just sell only the processor. They don't want to get into the business of making heat sinks and stuff. So. Uh, there are some specialized groups that does include um, uh, making the heat sinks as well within Intel or AMD, but primarily Intel and AMD are really, uh, their only goal is to sell the chips to others to put it together in, in a system, for example, Dell or HP or other um, Z, uh, ASUS or other companies that do all these things. So they provide what is called a reference design. A reference design means that when they sell the processor, they show that this processor can be cooled. It can be, um, uh, so they have to provide a proof of concept that it can be cooled with a, with a low cost approach. And they show it with this thermal design power. There are other uh, aspects that also generate power, what is called total design current. This total design current is very, very high IMAX. This is based on some high currents that happen when you switch on a computer or something. Uh, there, the power dissipated is higher than TDP, but the thermal solutions are always designed for uh, TDP, and the transient parts does involve slightly higher power than the TDP. In such cases, the thermal inertia in the system is able to handle it, and often, the second aspect that arises is that ambient temperature. 
because they don't want, they can't design for individual climate conditions they have to pick and choose the worst case and many of the worst case scenarios are such that the desktop segments often use an ambient temperature of close to 38 to the 40 close to 39 degrees celsius uh, on average and uh, servers have an inlet of 35c because um, but this is also changing because there are many people who want to operate at a much higher hotter temperature these servers um, because they usually go in a in a room that is well conditioned that is the expectation and then there are so called add in cards like video cards and uh, the xeon pi or the co processors gp gpu cards all of them see very very high temperatures because they are always put at the end um, through what is called pcie express uh, slots and also if you are designing for laptops or any mobile devices now you have to design uh, these systems to work even when they are in uh, at different altitudes because you will be using your phone while on air travel uh, or any such thing so density changes also so thermal design all often encompasses many of these aspects and um, we'll discuss some 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 of those so in a typical microprocessor cooling this is the architecture that is often um, this image is uh, coming from um, Intel and uh, the green is the so-called substrate and these are the solder balls and they go connect to a motherboard so the motherboard will will be somewhere here if you can see my uh, cursor so the motherboard will be there and the power will be connected and it will be sent through these solder balls to the substrate and they in in effect go and see what is called that silicon dye that is this green area and they have themselves some uh, um, solder balls or the so-called uh, bumps i will discuss that uh, in a bit in a zoomed version but then then there is a processor and usually these processors have highly non-uniform power in order to dissipate the heat uh, it is always better to spread it and get to a much more uniform stage and then you mount a heat sink and whenever you bring two materials together as you all know the contact area is usually very very poor the actual contact area the apparent contact area is is what we measure but the actual contact area because of microscopic peaks and valleys uh, it is very very small on the other hand the silicon dyes this is a silicon while this uh, substrate is a copper plus there are n number of layers that is put in for example in the substrate for servers there are 23 layers where there is a so-called fr4 fr4 is a di electric dielectric material and then there is a copper there is a fr4 so these are used as a way of communicating information between the die to the rest of the components in a motherboard so that information um, so this substrate material is much more flexible compared to the silicon die so when the silicon expands and contracts uh, this uh, this substrate material flexes much more that means making a co permanent contact with this copper block that is shown here that is referred as ihs here integrated heat spreader that is the terminology that is often used by the sector manufacturers he said now the heat that needs to be spread from the die to the top side which is often referred as the active side the transistors are on the corners or at the bottom not corner at the bottom here so if i do the zoom up of this it looks like this uh, if you see the red area so the c4 bumps are here and this is your die or chip electronic chip and they have what is called underfill so that uh, and they provide some support we won't get into that part and then inside that as i discussed to you when i discussed about the silicon die there are a number of interconnects these are called on chip interconnect because these connect all the transistors to 
each other. They are called the on-chip interconnect. And these solder poles and the package wiring that comes off the package uh, through the motherboard, they are called off-chip interconnect because they are the off-chip interconnect is the one that connects to the external world. The on-chip interconnect is the one that connects individual transistors and memory devices among each other. And there are many, many layers of those on-chip interconnects. This is by itself is a major heating problem as well. There is a lot of I square R type losses, the joule heating losses in these. And so the on-chip interconnect, as you can see, some transistors are far, some transistors are close by. So have to be connected uh, in such a way that the information tra um, that is transferred from one transistor to other, there is no delay. So the idea is to reduce the delay. Uh, otherwise, because um, the information processing cannot happen uh, seamlessly. Anyway, we won't get into those aspects. Um, so the is often removed from the other side where the transistors are not there. So this side is where the heat is being removed. And this green guy here is the silicon dye. So you put what is called TIM. TIM is thermal interface material because there is imperfect contact between two given surfaces. And the heat is first spread from the processor or silicon dye to an integrated heat spreader that is often a proper block. That is in, in effect is interface using another TIM, thermal interface material, and that contacts a heat sink that is shown here on the top. So that, <clears throat> that is the typical architecture uh, for desktop servers and stuff. But in the case of mobiles, there is no uh, phones, essentially. There is no heat sink right, sitting right on top of it. Uh, in case of laptops, there is no room for that, so they remotely conduct the heat from the silicon dye to a location where they can mount, mount a heat sink. And that is often close to a web of a lap. And that's where the fan and the heat sink unit is placed. And this heat conduction uh, is often placed these days in modern day laptops using heat pipes or vapor chambers. And uh, in mobile phones, vapor chambers are becoming more and more common. So that's the architecture that is often used to pull these. And if you see, as I mentioned to you, package is a way to connect to uh, <clears throat> to uh, the external world. So that package used to be a very simple packages in the past, and now they've grown into 3D packages and uh, they are much more sophisticated. Initially, it was supposed to provide a mechanical enclosure so that the silicon dye is not damaged. Now, it, the optimization of the package is the way to deliver performance of these uh, uh, modern day processes. So I will skip these things, but I will keep the slides information for your reference um, in the, uh, so I'll keep it in the PowerPoint or PDF that I'll be uploading. So typically, in a simplistic fashion, the, there are three levels of packaging. Sometimes there are nine levels of packaging. But for a simple, uh, uh, keeping it simple means first level is connecting the substrate to the silicon dye, and that is called the first level packaging. If you take all these processes or uh, processing units and ASICs and you mount it on either is the second level pocket packaging, and the third level is the so-called system level packaging. So these three levels of packages, people address, many people address different levels. For example, this system level packaging and the second level packaging is addressed by Dell and HP. The first level packages is often addressed by the say, semiconductor manufacturer like Intel and AMD. So Moore's law is, it is not a law, but it's more of an observation made by Gordon Moore who founded Intel said that if we shrink the transistors um, every two, um, essentially 18 to 24 months, or, and you, you increase this uh, wafer size, 
uh, twice, then you get four four times the benefit. And that was the initial assumption or initial observation that he was able to put together a principle by which people can keep shrink, making the transistor smaller and smaller that will give more cost uh, benefits uh, as well as improving the energy efficiency. It can be shown very by simple means that one can per transistor energy consumed goes down as you go down in the transistor size. But those uh, trends have stopped recently because of more leakage power. But anyway, one of the main important implications of Moore's law is that if you recall, uh, if you uh, notice this system that is shown here um, is what is called an ASCII red supercomputer. This ASCII red supercomputer is uh, world's top supercomputer back in 1997. Uh, it had used some 10,000 Pentium chips and it delivered what is called one teraflop. Tera is 10 power 12, flop is floating point operations. Um, and this was the first time any computer had crossed the teraflop mark and and it had costed some um, 55 uh, million dollars to make this and it occupied a big room that is about 1600 square feet and it consumed 850 kilowatts. This comes from Wikipedia information and uh, but Intel using Moore's law uh, while I'm not trying to sell Intel, but uh, there are companies like uh, AMD and NVIDIA. They also make the same type of processors and they deliver one teraflop in one processor. Instead of all the room, the entire room full of 1600 square feet full of uh, machines or Pentium chips because of the so-called Moore's law that they kept decreasing the size of the transistors and increasing the number of transistors in a given area. So that increase in the number of transistors now has delivered for just 300 watts of power, one teraflop. The power consumed itself tells the story of energy efficiency uh, offered by shrinking the transistors and also the performance. So not only the power has come down significantly from 860, 850 kilowatt to 300 watts all the way to delivering the same performance but of course this was a chip chip that was uh, <clears throat> uh, delivered in 2013 so this processor um, this uh, ASCII red was installed in 1997 so it took almost 16 years to get to this but nevertheless shrinking the transistors is the primary reason for getting to this stage what is the so i've been talking about all these things uh, what is the real challenge let's put some perspective if you look at this graph these are the process heat flux that is consumed or to be dissipated on the vertical axis note that this is a log axis and the horizontal the temperature on the x-axis so if you see the uh, some uh, historical or some information about this is the solar surface this is the ro uh, rocket motor size and so on if you really see the logic chip average temp average heat flux and the temperature it needs to be kept below is that it needs to be kept below some 100 degrees C, let's say. It dissipates uh, about, uh, on average, some of these processors, um, they dissipate up to 100 watts per centimeter square. But there are hot spots because it's highly non uniform power distribution. Those hot spots can be very, very high, can be close to 500 watts per centimeter square. Some of the power amplifiers or even peak power uh, fluxes are there, hot spots are there and they have to be kept below a very small temperatures. But if you look at sun's surface itself, it's 6,000 degree Kelvin, and it is still lower than some of the hotspots that are seen on power amplifiers. So what this says is that the heat flux is an extremely challenging situation uh, for these electronics. And uh, some 
solutions people have been developing their own solutions for these and uh, we will discuss some some of these things in this course and uh, i'm still today i'm going to focus on all the different aspects for example when there is low power typically fined heat sinks are used when it is high power um uh, there are some sophisticated solutions have been developed and we'll discuss these some of these things in the course so if you really look at what is happening today is that we started uh, with the single core uh, and right around 2004 2005 people started to shift towards what is called multi core and now many of the processes are uh, are the so called many core era and what i mean by this core is that what is happening is that when you had single core architectures the cores were shrinking because of what is called leakage current that i will be discussing very shortly and the cores kept shrinking these are uh, 180 micron 130 100 if you see this is just a uh, if you multiply 0.18 times 0.7 you'll get 0.13 0.13 times 0.7 you'll get 0.1 so if you keep multiplying that is called a technology generation this is one technology generation this is second technology the next gen technology this is every two years new technology comes from intel but that has slowed now Uh, but nevertheless what happened was single core it was becoming extremely complex to deliver performance and the power consume was getting larger and larger so they moved from this single core architecture to what is called multi core architecture and what was happening was this uh, they will use this core this core is nothing but a cpu and uh, and it has its own memory uh, associated with it once this gets hot uh it jumps to this core once this gets hot it jumps the so called core hopping and so on that's how the temperature and the power consumed is balanced or managed in these and they use parallel processing within the chip itself to provide the performance needed so what is thermal packaging so we have just discussed about the overall pictures If you look at thermal packaging as we discussed this before i'll just skip this slide and where is the heat being generated fundamentally um we will not i won't get into the details here but i want to discuss one important aspect which is called the uh, logical or the landauer's principle is that fundamentally you need at least two atoms to come up with a switch essentially all the transistors that are implemented in a processor are like switches and valves you turn the switch on or off that is one zero signal essentially the binary number so you use the switch as a way to generate one or either one or zero and uh, so the logical logically that means that uh, it has to have two transistors at least so every time this landauer's principle says that when you have two such uh, uh transistors then any time what is called erasing a bit let's say um you may or you may not recall the digital electronics um there are these so called or gate and gate nand gate or uh, nor gate and so on so in all this digital circuitry if you know the input you can find out what the output is but if you know the output you cannot find the input there is a logical error or irreversible logic in that implementation because of that nature one has to once an operation is completed that operation is to be completely wiped and a new operation should be started every time one wipes the uh, previous operation that is the erases that then one incurs this level of entropy um change that is kb here is the boltzmann constant t is the absolute temperature logarithm of 2 is the natural log of 2 is the uh, the uh, number that comes because of two atom system and that is that multiplied by the absolute temperature gives the energy dissipated for any given operation of a transistor so this is the so called fundamental limit of power dissipation any time you implement any computing system this level of power needs to be dissipated there are others as well but but you if you really look at what is happening today is that there are two modes of power dissipation 
one or power heat generation in a system in, in any of these processes or even in IGBTs and others. One is the so-called active power and the other one is the so-called standby power. That is, you're not doing anything, you're just switching off your computer, but still it is in the not switching off sleep in a sleep mode, but still there is some amount of power that, and that is being consumed. The acting active power are uh, two parts. One is the so-called switching power. The other is the so-called active leakage power. Because if you recall the nanometers that we were talking about seven nanometers, so the <clears throat> The distance between source and drain, there is something called gate in a transistor, and that has become, they are so closely placed, the source and drain, are that now there is some sort of a leakage that is happening. When the gate voltage is applied, it's like a valve that controls flow of current. So when the voltage is applied or removed, there is certain state that is induced in the transistor. So, but even when the ga gate voltage is applied or not, there is some amount of leakage that is happening and that is a useless power that is cannot be avoided because of the small transistor sizes. That is the so-called leakage power and it is nothing but the leakage current times the voltage. And you know, you, you see that one of the leakage, which is one of the very important leakage currents in a current day modern modern uh, transistor, uh, I'm sorry, some drilling construction is going on. Is it too noisy? Hello? Am I audible or am I just talking to myself? Hello? Hello, are you all here? <coughs> Hello, sir. Ah, it's fine, sir. Okay, by there was some background noise. Is that okay? No, no noise, sir. It is very clear to me. Okay, great. Thank you. Some construction work is going on near my building, so. Okay, okay, sir. But there is no disturbance at all. Okay, okay. Thank you. So there is one leakage current that has a very strong temperature dependence. And this is the, this leakage current is called sub threshold leakage current. And if you don't control the leakage current, what will happen is you will burn the processor itself, as you can see in this picture. So what happens is when you heat it, the leakage current goes up and it dissipates more power. So as it dissipates more power, it again, the current leakage current increases. So there is a thermal runaway situation in this uh, case. And so you will burn the process. In the process of testing this particular case, um, you can see that they have burnt the processor itself completely. So that's why the traditional electronics uh, cooling design where people give you, oh, go ahead, uh, use 100 watts of power and cool it is not feasible these days because one has to have not only hardware implementation but also software. So the software will there are millions of tens, uh, uh, sensors, thermal sensors, uh, literally millions of se thermal sensors in in a, in a processor. You may notice your uh, laptop is as as it time. As time grows, uh, after three, four years, your laptop automatically automatically shuts down because uh, there are sensors that are detecting certain temp temperatures, and once it exceeds a certain critical value, it automatically sends the signal that you should shut down the processor. So that's why laptop itself shuts down, and the sensors allow one to reduce. The one way to control this is to decrease the speed of the transistor or the processor itself. So once the temperature reaches high, the one way to do uh, control of that temperature is to reduce the power it is consuming. So in order to reduce the power, then one has to reduce the frequency. This is the so-called switching power where alpha is 
uh, a constant or not a constant. Alpha is something, it's like a coefficient. C is the capacitance of your load or the capac electrical capacitance. V is the voltage. And you will notice, uh, we'll discuss a few things. And then that is V square times F. This V is on the order of one volt these days, one volt DC. All these processes are DC. If you recall, we have AC at the wall where we plug our computer. So the AC current is converted or step changed, step down or um, to certain voltages. And uh, all the motherboard, uh, many of the phones, etc., because they are operating using a battery, it has to, the 12 volt is the uh, battery voltage. And so the system needs to operate at DC currents. So that makes that your voltage at the wall is 220 volts of AC and the voltage is brought down to 12 volts. That means the current, because the power required is 100 watts, if it is a desktop, the current would be going up as you go to uh, in the at the transistor level, you can even see up to 400 to 600 amps at a single transistor of DC current. So the current at individual transistor level is extremely high. Nevertheless, this is the power. Alpha is just a coefficient that varies from zero to one. Uh, it is called activity factor. The CV square is the power consumed uh, that's the energy. Energy times the frequency that is one by second gives you the power. And the frequency of switching, that is how fast a transistor switches from zero to one, one to zero type. So that free switching frequency. So if you reduce this frequency, then the power consumed goes down. So that's how they control the temperatures. Once the power consume goes down, the temperature drops. And that's how we prevent any of the thermal runaway from happening. The same scenario exists in exists in uh, batteries as well these days, where the batteries can catch fire, as you ha may have heard. So the principle of cooling solution development uh, will follow uh, that that has been developed for uh, electronic can be used for batteries as well. So current day, how are we? So this is energy consumption. So if you see, there have been studies that show that. Right around 2040 is when there is something called three atom transistor. Uh, the, the fundamental limits I talked to you before was two atom. This is a three atom transistor. Until then, the many of the semiconductor manufacturers are planning to keep shrinking their transistors. And they reduce the so-called active power, that is the switching power, and that is and the leakage power. And any they want to reduce the task um, the time that is used to complete a task and reduce the standby power. These are the strategies that current day manufacturers, semiconductor manufacturers are using to reduce the computations per kilowatt hour. This is how much uh, calculations can you do for given kilowatt hour. As you can see, it kept increasing higher and higher, and it is expected to get to this three Feynman's uh, three atom transistor very soon but I will skip this fast. And I pointed out to this laptop example previously, your laptop shuts down by itself sometimes, as you may have noticed after three, four years, especially. And because they are designed uh, uh, to have some software intervention. So electronics cooling by definition, what it means or thermal management, the objective is to maintain a device or die temperature at or below a fixed value. This is done to guarantee the performance and also guarantee a reliability or the life that was quoted by the manufacturer. Usually these processes are rated for five years. And uh, but uh, the companies like Dell or uh, or HP, they may offer, in, in the case of servers, they may offer three years of warranty, but these processes themselves are expected to last at least for five years. The reason um, that um, they can last is that 
the processors themselves come with extremely high, so highly sophisticated soft software intervention. That is, uh, there are three limits of uh, how one manages. When the ambient is very cool, the fans need not run faster, so they will reduce the fan speed. They will reduce the um, performance. Uh, uh, you know, they reduce the cooling power, cooling solution, power consumption, and you know, you will get the performance that is expected to be delivered. Um, and that is often called uh, a re reliability limit. But what happens is when it gets closer to a threshold temperature, let's say 95 degree is the operating temperature that will, if you exceed that 95 degree, the life of the processor may be cut short. So they don't want to exceed that 95 degrees Celsius. So that 95 degrees Celsius, what happens is that at that point, they throttle the performance. That's why you will see that sometimes when the system gets hotter, you your all your applications are running very very slow because the speed the switching speed was throttled essentially it was reduced by two thirds usually that is the rule of thumb is that if it is the three gigahertz processor and then once it reaches this 95 degrees celsius then it will be cut down to two gigahertz because two by three of three is two gigahertz that's usually the uh, game that all these uh, manufacturers play is that they bring there is a sensor that sits on the processor that tells okay my temperature has reached 95 so please cut it down cut down the power so they cut down the frequency so the power goes down so the cooling solution is now still able to manage the temperature but sometimes uh, what happens is as time goes on some of the um, thermal interface material or many other things could go wrong and the temperatures exceeds this 95 degrees. Once it exceeds, gets closer to some threshold value they, they have set, let's say 100 degrees, it will automatically shut down. So that way they can prevent, the, that is called a damage limit. That is, they can prevent the computer from losing its data itself. By shutting down, the processor can be used still again by restarting the computer or providing better cooling solution and all the data can be retrieved. But if once they allow for temperatures to increase continuously, then uh, if they don't allow cut this, shut it down, then you may not even retrieve the data that is stored on that system. So that's why these are the typical solutions that are there and I discussed with you some of this before. So in a typical thermal packaging architecture, you see that um, there are three main resistances or two uh, main resistance and three junction points often referred in many of the data sheets and in many of the publications as well. Uh, is that junction temperature is the die temperature or the silicon temperature. Case temperature is case is the integrated heat spreader that is often referred to the point shown here. That is one thermal uh, node. There is an average temperature of that case and then the ambient temperature. So this junction to case is what um, the Intel AMD people will control. And um, this resistance of junction to case and this case to ambient is what is controlled by people like in uh, Dell and HP and so on. And many of the academic uh, research and others focus on this aspect. Uh, but uh, because the Intel AMD people want to control this as a secret, uh, their improvement of RGC. However, this is where many of the technologies have emerged to cool these processes. That you can have some heat pipes lid instead of a copper lid. And many, many these days there are cooling jets, this, that. We'll discuss those things briefly in the upcoming lectures. So here's a, that Xeon Phi card that I talked to you about one teraflop delivering one teraflop in 2013. This is how it is being cooled. It is the processor is here. And these are the so-called memory devices that you use in your computer DDR or DRAMs. The RAMs, they are put in the motherboard itself. They are also on the backside of this processor. 
this is just one example and you connect power to this these are the power sockets which receive uh, um, power to this board and that power can be stepped down to 12 volts of dc using this so called voltage regulators they also generate power because whenever you convert a uh, step down or convert the power ac to dc dc or um, this is the 12 volt dc supply uh, you know that is used here so you are stepping that 12 volt to even lower voltages because the memory or the rams require about 5 volts of dc the processor requires about 1 volt of dc there are other parts in this board so you whenever you are stepping down voltage the because of inefficiency in stepping down there is inefficiency and so that always shows up as heat generated so the power is generated by pretty much the rams the voltage regulators these are the inductors voltage regulator uh, consists of two parts one is an inductor that is shown in the gray color and the yellow are the so called fets field effect transistors and the processor itself so all these things need to be cooled and as i said there is a power being dissipated on the back side as well because of standards that the back side cannot have enough room the many of the challenges in electronics is such that there is no room to cool there is no way to put anything on the side so here what they have done is to pick up the heat from the back conduct it to this two yellow regions here using heat pipes come up and that is carried by heat pipes to this heat sink so it is cooled by this heat sink here the processor is cooled by this heat sink there is a fan here and it has to meet certain uh, uh, acoustic requirements as well as we uh, will have one uh, one and a half hours lecture on acoustics as well that is 7 uh, uh, decibel of this is d is missing here 7 decibel average Uh, is the limit acoustic limit of this so you don't want the processors to be making more noise or the fans to be making more noise so there is a limit to the fan speed there is a limit to many of these things and this heat sink air cooled heat sink has a vapor chamber base this vapor chamber is very similar to a heat pipe and the fins are mounted on top of it so this is one full architecture or a packaging of a full system as a subsystem that is often used in supercomputers and the real card looks like this these are the this is the knights corner package or a processor memory device voltage regulators the 12 volt power comes from this end so all these are used and they are crammed and there so there is absolutely no space if you look at the power density or watt per meter cube it's also very very high so the exit temperature of this hot air will be close to 70 degrees celsius so that's how much power uh, and uh, because it's air cooled uh, that one has to dissipate okay so if we are often cooling solutions are designed for steady state operation but one has to also manage unsteady or transient situations as well and uh, the thermal resistance as we discussed the three important aspects are the die to case temperature and case to air temperature and um, so then if you want to really understand the capacitance um, what is the how fast the uh, and there are aspects in servers and now they are used even in mobile phones there is something called turbos turbo speed you may have heard the word uh, if you have used any of the um servers for high performance computing is that turbo is uh, is a very very high speed of switching if the processor on average can deliver 2 gigahertz of switching turbos can enable up to 4 to 5 gigahertz for a very short duration of time so in such cases one has to understand the transient part as well how um this is Uh, so there one has to develop an rc network like a capacitance resistance network for all the individual elements for example die will have a capacitance uh, and so on okay so this is an example typically this is a very old bold example where is a, a 
it's a plastic package where there's a chip uh, die bond heat spreader then there is an encapsulant there is a heat sink board you can see there are a number of paths that the heat takes so the there are so many parallel resistances and so many series resistances that one has to account all these is encompassed into this so called rjc this is the junction to case resistance and this is the external or case to ambient resistance so this is given one value and this is given one value in this example the the people make it one dimensional and finally make it somehow uh, work with this uh, example and transiently you will also see that these packages have if i use a steady power and it's a constant power then this is a semi log plot you will see a different response time but because there are so many it's, it's like a composite material that you will find that each material has its own time constants and so the response of individual materials is actually quite complex if i were to look at the transient performance of this chip how much heat is going transiently to the top versus transiently to the bottom is quite different than uh, um, when you compare it at steady state so it needs to be understood if one is looking for transient terms like igbts for example in uh, automobiles the electric vehicles now you have this battery operated vehicles where the battery is delivering uh, dc but the the motors or other elements in the car if it is hybrid is a ac so the dc needs to be converted to ac and the and in such cases where this uh, a lot of switching happening there the temperature swings are quite high that is it's a transient cooling situation not a steady state cooling is developing steady state solution is not cooling solution is not useful there you have to not only manage the resistances but also the capacitance if the capacitance is very low the device will swing to very high temperature and then it will come down to cold temperature very fast so the device will undergo a lot of thermal cycling it will go up and down up and down that means it will fail sooner so in transient situation sometimes it is helpful to have high capacitance in the form of phase change materials or some such thing to absorb the transients and allow a moderate rise in temperature so we'll discuss some aspects little later maybe in the fifth class a fifth day or sixth day uh before i shoot to data centers um can we take a 10 minute break and uh, assemble back here at uh, 3:30 or is it okay if we can if you want to continue i i'm okay either way low can we take a break is, is anyone on yes sir yes. yeah yes sir yes sir thank you sir so can, thank you can we yeah can we assemble back at uh, 3:30 please okay sir nice sir thank you
Okay, so I'll get started um, back again. So we'll wind up. So the next next aspect that uh, today I'll cover is the data centers, um, because this is growing. This is a big value for Indian setting. Because India is one of the prime market for cell phones. The data centers are growing at an extremely rapid rate. And India is investing a lot in digital. And um, as you all know about digital India and stuff. So data centers becomes one of the primary uh, drivers of uh, digital growth. So um, as we discussed, silicon die transistor, silicon die package. Then what happens is that in the data centers, then they get assembled in what is called boards. These are called uh, boards, and then you take these boards and you assemble them, and they become what is called a chassis. And when you put all these chassis in one box, it's called a rack, and you put n number of racks, this is from Google, is called um, the data center. As we discussed previously, power density is watts per meter square or watts per centimeter square is the challenge at the package level. However, power consumed is, is the challenge at the data center level. At the data center level, for example, Google and some of the supercomputers that I'll be discussing next um, is that it consumes close to even some of the data centers consume close to 60 to 100 megawatts. So it is extremely high 
level of power that is being dissipated. So one has to really pay attention to cooling because if the data center is air cooled data center, the power consumed by just for cooling itself is one third of it. If I have one megawatt, then I'm dissipating or I'm using one third of one megawatt just for cooling the uh, system itself. So that's why, again, this heat flux challenge we already talked about. But let's look at the power challenge in this case. Is that if you look at the so called supercomputers, top supercomputers, the world's uh, supercomputers are ranked every six months. And uh, there is something called top 500 org that I've shown here. So they do the ranking of these uh, supercomputers from the world, throughout the world. And uh, the power now, the trend in supercomputing, um, uh, you know, the one of the major things is like uh, during cold war, cold wars or cold world wars or cold wars between US and Russia, whoever had nuclear arsenal, there used to be, they used to consider themselves as superpower, then came economic superpower, now. This information superpower is what is driving this whole thing. That is, whoever has the most powerful computer are able to deliver some of the interesting discoveries that others will not be able to do. And so that's why there's a huge race that is happening, especially uh, in, uh, throughout. And one of the primary drivers of this innovation nowadays is the supercomputer. Who, whoever has the supercomputing capability are able to deliver solutions much more superior than others. So this, even though this is not so often talked about in the Indian media or anything like that, but you find that it is quite a important aspect in the digital uh, India situation. For example, K supercomputer, this is from Japan, consumed about 10.5 megawatts, and it delivered what is called petaflop. Petaflop is, um, sorry, um, the power consumed is 12.6 megawatts and it delivered 10.5 petaflop. Peta is 10 power 15 flops. Flops is floating operations per second. And then came what is called IBM system. This is in US, Sequoia, and it consumed less power, but it delivered more power, uh, more performance. In supercomputers are often referred are often ranked based on the flops that it has delivered, that is floating operations per second. So, so it has now, Japan, again, after 11 to 10 years, has regained the top position in the, the recent uh, 2020 race, is that uh, it has delivered 415 petaflops, and it has consumed 28.3 megawatts of power. The race currently is on to achieve what is called exascale computer. Exascale computer, supercomputer, it will deliver 10 power 18 operations, floating, uh, floating point operations per second. So that's where everyone is targeting. And in 2021, people are expecting that there will be ex exascale computer. And it will dissip, but however, it will consume about 40 uh, megawatts of power. So the challenge, as you can see, is that the power consumed is extremely high. So all the power that is consumed should be used to do the computing operations, not for auxiliaries like cooling. So that's where one has to make not only the cooling solution effective, but it should be efficient as well. And that's one of the bigger challenges at the data center level. If you look at a data center, there are many ways to classify a data center for the purpose of this class um, that we will treat that as being primarily classified as air cooled or liquid cooled. Air cooled data centers are extremely energy inefficient versus liquid cooled. However, liquid brings a major challenge. And because it one thing it adds a lot of cost. The other thing is if water leaks, if it is water cooled and if water leaks, all these electronics are powered by currents and electricity. So there could be a major disaster in terms of losing all the uh, computing equipment. So 
that is the um, challenge. But currently, let me just discuss the primary way of uh, discussing data centers is public cloud providers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and there are many others. Then the scientific computing, these are the so-called supercomputers, and then the co-location centers, private clouds, where individually each institute has its own supercomputer so that they can manage their own information better than just sending it to Google or Amazon. So as I discussed, we will discuss that air-cooled versus liquid-cooled. And if you see, this is one of the questions I typically ask. If I am putting 100 watts to a computer, how much turns up as heat. Can anyone answer? If I'm putting, if I'm saying 100 watts of power is being consumed by a microprocessor, how much of it actually turns up as heat? All of it, part of it, can anyone tell me? You can even uh, put it in the chat. You want. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll have more questions in the next classes, so we can have much more of a discussion rather than one way conversation. Uh, till now, so if you look at the power consumption, is a very old chart from Rocky Mountain Institute, but it's a very useful chart. If I put 100 watts uh, and fuel into a power power plant, almost 67 part of it percent of it is lost in the power plant itself as a loss. And then during transmission from the power plant, let's say a coal power plant, 10% is lost due to distribution systems. Then if it is an air-cooled data center, 33% of it is lost as, um, uh, as to the cooling system power consumption itself. And usually data centers have 4% electricity, that is for lighting and so on. That is 4%. If you keep going down this rank, you'll find that the value add of a computation is only less than one. All the power that was delivered to a computer ends up as heat in one way or other, either in the con uh, conversion devices or at the processor level. It all shows up as heat. So if you are commissioning a system that has 500 watts of power, then one has to be ready to develop a cooling solution to uh, dissipate 500 watts of power. Except that some devices need cooler operating temperature, some devices need hotter operating temperature. They are okay with hotter operating. Nevertheless, they all need to be cooled. As I mentioned to you, the cooling and power provision in the current day systems is close to, this is power provision, that is UPS and others, they consume about 43%. Actually, the data center servers that are doing the actual computation is also consuming only 43%. The rest, storage and networking devices, they consume the 11 to 14%. So you'll see that the cooling is one of the major talked about aspects. That is, air-cooled data centers consume very, very high level of loss, power loss, because the cooling itself is consuming so much power. And if you look at a typical data center, that is air-cooled data center, as an example, here you have these green-looking boxes are the so-called racks that are cooled by air. The blue arrows here show the air, the cold air that is entering this, picking up heat, and the red arrows are the hot air that goes to what is called these blue boxes. These blue boxes are often referred as crack units computer room air conditioning unit. There, there is a liquid to air heat exchanger. So this hot air goes and exchanges heat with the cold air, cold water that is coming from a chiller, typically. And that cold water goes through this liquid to air heat exchanger, picks up the heat from the hot air, pulls the hot air to cold air and that cold air goes to the bottom and comes up through these perforated tiles. These grayish areas are called perforated tiles. I'll show you a better picture. And that's how this cycle happens. On the other hand, the hot water goes to the chiller 
and gets cooled, the chiller itself is cooled by a cooling tower typically or a dry cooler that is essentially only a radiator. So that radiator um, then gives the cold water to the chiller and then that's how this water loop happens. This is a typical arrangement of any air cooled data centers where there is always a chiller and especially in a hot country like India, chiller becomes a must in some uh, some locations, not always. So often what people try to do to avoid this cost associated with running a chiller because chiller is the, one of the major cost elements in this. And they what they do is try to locate the data center itself in a in a climate zone where it is amenable to just run only a cooling tower or uh, a dry cooler. Uh, Google, Facebook, and all they always pick a location where um, the temperature more or less stays isothermal throughout the year and they make use of it but in some occasions for example the stock market in mumbai they cannot move their data center to some place they have to have it in their house itself for whatever reasons privacy and security concerns there one has to operate with chiller so then they are expending more power when you can't locate the data center to a place where you can cut down cost, the operating cost, if the uh, typical rule of thumb is that if one megawatt of power is being produced or is required to operate a data center, almost $1 million is spent in purely operating that data center. So that's how much um, is the cost associated with running a data center. So how is this data center is classified? So you can't compare the data center, one data center, someone may say, um, I have a very efficient data center, but you can't debate it. So they have developed some metrics to evaluate these data centers, and they are called as the data center metrics like TUV. TUE is the power usage effectiveness. What it has is a ratio, which is total data center annual energy. Note that it is energy that is in kilowatt hour. Total data center divided by total IT annual energy. That is how much power from the utility, utility that entered the data center all the way from the cooling tower to this divided by what is the kilowatt hour of power consumed by these green boxes where all the um, uh, where all the processes and uh, computing equipment is kept. So that is the uh, most simplest metric uh, that people have developed. It is easy to measure that uh, because you can put two power uh, units and you can measure how much was entering the data center and how much actually enters the the computing facilities are housed. So it is only an infrastructure metric. Doesn't give all the um, details. For example, some of the big shots like data, uh, Facebook and others, uh, they have found a way to change the PUV. Um, so um, this PUV does not tell how efficient, it is how effectively power is being used. That is the, it is not an energy efficiency metric. It is an effectiveness metric. And uh, the second important thing is some people move, instead of having a large fan outside, they move the fan power in the computing facility itself. That means the power gets your denominator go, goes up and this goes down on the numerator. So it becomes equal to close to one. That means you are affect, running this the best case scenario for PUV is one. Anything above that means that you are ineffectively using the power. So people started to play lots of games. And uh, so this is a very debatable topic in the current situation. However, people showcase their if you go to Google data center or Facebook, they all show this PUV lively. You can monitor their PUV currently all the data centers 
that are there, you can monitor them. They'll show that these PUVs have been optimized and energy efficient because this has become a one of their selling points is that they have used renewable energy to run the center. And they are reducing PUVs that are close to one and so on. So this PUV itself has a lot of temperature effects. So those are the aspects that one often goes. And so there have been additional metrics that people have developed, what is called total usage effectiveness, um, where people identify how much power is actually entering the compute, the CPU, memory, drive, uh, drive and so on. And they also try to figure out what was the uh, total energy that entered the server room itself, so that individually they can track actually what is the compute uh, uh, usage. And so there, there have been many discussions on these topics, but these are the data center metrics that are typically used to understand how much power or how efficient or how effectively power is being used in a data center. Most of the air pool data centers have what is called perforated tiles or raised floor architecture. A raised floor is as shown here in the small picture here, is that you have the CRAC is a computer room air conditioning unit. It is a liquid air heat exchanger. Liquid is the chilled water that comes in. Air is the hot air from the data center itself. What they do is that they push the cold air to the bottom and there are holes on the bottom that push the cold air to the top and into the rack because the rack has servers and the servers have fans. They pull the air get all the heat from the com compute components, dissipate the heat, carry the hot water to air. As you can see, there is a plenum, a return air plenum that takes the hot air and again exchanges heat. This is how the data center is operated in many typical situations. You can see this example of a perforated tile is that these are racks to be cooled. However, there is a perforated tile here uh, and cold air comes through the bottom goes up through this and it goes through these racks where there will be compute components the hot air it will go to the right side and the left side the hot air gets picked up and they go through the top you can see the holes on the top the hot air goes up there are air handling units that pull the hot air and then somewhere down here or on the right hand side, there will be a crack unit where the air uh, will be cooled down and it will be circulated back into this. That's how large scale data centers operate. And people have now, especially for supercomputing and very high performance computing systems, people have used what are called the liquid cooling that is expected to enable what is the exascale error that I've been talking about, exabyte that is 10 power 18 bytes. Their liquid cooling is much more efficient, as you all know very well, than the air cooling, but there are operational constraints where the water leakage should not be there, so one has to use sensors um, to ensure there is no leakage, but you can't use one sensor because if that sensor goes wrong, uh, then you are running into trouble. Um, if you put two sensors, then you run into another problem. If one sensor is reporting one information and the other sensor is reporting another information, that is one sensor says it's leaking, the other sensor says it's not leaking. So which sensor would you trust? That becomes a problem. So you have to use three sensors or more sensors to poll and find out what is actually. So this is a very interesting, uh, uh, this uh, whole um, sensors and all these things becomes extremely interesting from a practical perspective how to design and water quality is also important because if you grow uh, if you have micro channels as the cooling solution plate put on top of a processor and let's say those micro channels have um, 200 micron spacing between the fins those micro channels will get clogged if you have poor poor water quality in the system if the particle sizes are on the order of 200 microns, it will go close that pins and then the hot temp it will start to rise up. 
and also if you have bacteria and other uh, microbial growth that will also cause issues so there's so many issues with liquid cooling that people tend to still take stay with air cool as much as feasible and as i said if there is a leakage then it can even destroy the um, microprocess and others so there are many ways i will discuss this little later as well but in general there are four different options that people have been exploring that is there is a pump and a cold plate or the heat sink solution micro channel solution on top of a processor only then they said you can even immerse the this is so called immersion cooling where there is a dielectric liquid it could be oil dielectric oil like transformer oil or it could be um there are some degreasing oils uh, degreasing solutions from 3m uh, company 3m where you take these boards and immerse them into the tank itself so there is no air cooling now they are in direct contact with things so you can have boiling inside happening in immersion cooling so these are the plethora of options that one in one immersion cooling is not new uh, immersion cooling is quite old Uh, even back in 1984, there was a immersion cooled supercomputer, but nevertheless, it has come up again as a primary driver, one of the important innovations in delivering this exascale computers. I say this is the. So there are lots of these things, and uh, I will skip this for time and um, say that you know all these cooling solutions. One important message is that. air cooling doesn't necessarily mean it is ineffective uh, inefficient the puv for air cooling can be very high if they put the air cooling solution in a climate zone where the air is always very very cold people try to operate data centers in uh, norway finland and so on because they have the temperature is cold and they don't have to run a chiller and even if they run a chiller it is only for very few days in the whole year so there are air cooled systems like that and then uh, liquid cooled as you can see that one of the world's most efficient that is what people have claimed one of the facebook uh, data center is placed in a location called prineville it has a puv of 1.07 and it is primarily air cooled data center so what liquid cooling does is that one of the things that air cooling cannot do is that it makes it very dense you can pack more number of processors more number of boards in a given space air cooling always needs a lot more space because air's heat carrying capacity is four times lower than the liquid uh, the liquid i'm talking about is water so that's why and um, so i'll stop with the data center introduction with this and um, i will move to now more um, topics that are relevant to our um, class now and this is the introduction that is needed to introduce at least the some of the main uh, conceptual framework that i'll be using to discuss the rest of the topics okay so i hope uh, you will participate with this um so you may have heard of this conduction shape factors correct you may have been teaching this conduction shape factors in your classes yes hello can you hear me i see yeah so there are at least <clears throat> so do you teach conduction shape factors in your class hello yeah please tell me yes sir 
we are ah. teaching the shear factor uh, for ah. radiation okay the view factors those okay um so these are conduction shear factors and okay. uh, what is the use of this is that these are very old way of doing things in the sense that if one has to approximate a 2D system into a 1D system or a 3D system into a 2D system, uh, these conduction shape factors are quite useful. And uh, one can generate approximate solutions. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that you will participate from this mo module on. Um, so um, let's, uh, let's try to get some discussion going. Um, so a typical shape factor is defined as some S is the shape factor K into delta T. Delta T is the temperature difference, uh, the hot and the cold temperature difference. K is the thermal conductivity of the material and S is something like uh, you, if you recall your Fourier's law of conduction, the yeah, heat transfer yeah. rate is K times delta T by uh, the length or the thickness yeah, yeah. of copper block. That thickness and area gets absorbed into this shape factor. Okay, sir. Okay, so sir. These are well documented in many books. And um, for example, this is a copy and paste from the book by uh, Encropra and Divit, Fundamentals of Heat and Mass Yeah, 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 yeah sir. Yeah. yeah. So that is this book, and you can yeah, see yeah. the shape factor is given as, for example, let's look at this case 10 that I will solve a simple problem. Uh, yeah. Next, yes, sir. there is a source or some device or some object at some temperature T1. It is a circular object whose diameter is D, and it is placed on top of another object that is at some temperature T2. So one can obtain this shape factor S as two, two times D. So let's look at one example in a in a electronic circuit. Um, here, uh, I'll I'll give a moment to uh, please read this example. So you can see that there is an electronic component here that is shown in the dashed box and it has a diameter of 10 mm. It is a circular uh, electronic component and it has a diameter of 10 mm. And it is epoxy, that is it's, it's, it is bonded to an aluminum block. And the joint, this resistance is given by 0.5 10 power minus 4 meter square Kelvin per watt. So always most of the joint thermal resistance, any of the joints are always normalized with respect to area. A thermal resistance is often written as Kelvin per watt. However, when you are talking about thermal contact resistance or joint thermal resistance, they are always normalized with respect to its area. So in this case, it is 0 0.5 10 power minus 4 meter square Kelvin per watt. So, so that is this value. Then on the top of the processor or the electronic component, there is some airflow that is happening. And the bottom where there is a block, that is at some temperature 25 degrees Celsius. So first, we have to draw a thermal resistance or electrical analog of this problem. And uh, can we talk about how the heat is going to flow? The heat is going to dissipate from the top side as well as from the bottom side. There will be some amount of heat that is going to the top 
some amount of heat that is going to the bottom. Can you guess which side will have more heat transfer? Top side or bottom side? So in general, in this case, we will find out, I will uh, we'll show that more heat will transfer to the bottom side than to the top side. The reason is the area of the diameter is very small versus you will find that if I draw a heat resist that is a resistance network, thermal resistance network, you will find that it has two parallel paths. One is going to the top where air is air cooled directly the one to the bottom where there is a heat sink or the aluminum block. So this is where the power is generated or power is put that is represented by some temperature Tc referring to T chip. Then some amount of heat is leaving to the top and the ambient temperature is given as 25 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, the bottom side as a epoxy joint and there is a shape factor. If you see here, heat is flowing from a smaller object and it is going to a larger object. So that is often called a spreading case and we'll discuss in detail next. This is, there is a certain resistance offered for spreading heat uh, from a smaller heat source to a larger heat source, a heat sink. So that heat, that spreading resistance is captured using this case number 10 of conduction shape factor. So we have contact joint resistance. This is the epoxy resistance. Then we have the spreading of heat happening from the electronic component, electronic component to the base of this large aluminum block. So those are the two resistance on the bottom and there is one resistance on the top. So this heat that is entering at this point will be split into two paths. So we say that what is going through the top as Q air, that is the amount of heat lost through the top side is Q air. And the amount of heat that is lost through the bottom is called Q state. The, the top side heat transfer is nothing but heat transfer using Newton's law of cooling. We use H into surface area. This is given as diameter of 10 mm by d square by 4. H is given as 25 watts per meter square Kelvin by d square by 4 times whatever the junction temperature happens to be minus the air temperature, which is at 25 degrees Celsius. <coughs> In the second question, it is saying if the component temperature must be held below 100 degrees C, what is the maximum allowed operating power? So that means we have we cannot exceed 100 degrees. So that's the absolute limit. So we use the Tc, the case temperature as 100 degrees Celsius at this point. So Tc 100 minus 25, H is given as 25. Uh, sorry, yeah, 25 watts per meter square Kelvin. And this is the area diameter of that circular electronic component is 10 mm. So this, when you calculate, will give you 0.15 watts. On the other hand, the next expression that is on the right hand side of this thermal resistance network is given by this. And 1 by 2 dK is the shape factor. These resistances are in series from this point to this point. Uh, can we I think the, there is some background noise? So you can see that there is a yeah, thus as uh, as Mr. Abdesh says, it more evident that. Now the bottom side will see higher um, heat transfer. 
and you can one of the things that one has to do um, is that if you see a printed circuit board maybe i'll go to another example so you can see that there are so many of these small small components there so we can't mount heat sinks for each and every component and sometimes um, it is hard to go find information for each and every heat source in the in the system so when you are trying to cool this board where do i mount heat sink because i can't mount for every heat source that is there so one has to make some sort of a um guess based on the power levels and the acceptable temperatures that is there for these in this case as an a classic example of this case is that you see that <laughs> the top side has only about uh, you know a certain small area and most of the heat is can be guessed that it will go only to the bottom side and not to the top side because of the small area that is available for heat transfer even if i give you very high heat transfer coefficients to 25 watts per meter square kelvin is itself a very high heat transfer coefficient because that means force convection is happening for natural convection as you may recall if it is cooled by natural convection it will only be 5 watts per meter square kelvin at the best case uh, so this is force convection even then very little heat transfer is happening to the top side that is primarily because that it <coughs> surface area that is available for heat transfer is very small so unless the power levels are on the order of 0.1 uh, less than 100 milliwatts or 200 milliwatts uh, you will typically need um, some kind of heat sink if the power is less than 100 milliwatts uh, in a populated motherboard then people ignore it and let it cool by air itself so that's one example that i start with and here we discussed conduction shape factor as a way to determine the so called spreading resistance <clears throat> so this spreading resistance and constriction resistance is quite common in in electronic systems whenever there is a change in the cross section of a area and when heat is flowing from one region with a different uh, to another region with a different cross sectional area it, you will either encounter a spreading resistance or you will encounter a constriction resistance for example one of the <coughs> major bottlenecks <coughs> in the current day cell phones is the spreading resistance because spread, as you can see that there is no fan in a cell phone so all the heat needs to be cooled by natural convection and do you think radiation will be important in a cell phone cooling situation can anyone type on the chat you all know that there is no um <coughs> fan in a cell phone so should we consider natural convection only or radiation is also important can anyone guess okay so i'll proceed so whenever you are <clears throat> radiation is important uh, at very high temperatures but in cell phones i will show this in the um whenever you are talking about comparing radiation heat transfer with uh natural convection you will find that radiation becomes equally important in cell phones in, in fact radiation is one of the important ways to dissipate heat that's why you will see that cell phones with black color 
versus pink color all have different different cost the same model but different colors give you different cost because they have to change the emissivity of that surface to ensure the same amount of heat transfer or heat loss so in fact in cell phones almost 50 to 60 percent of the total power at steady state is dissipated by radiation because of natural convection being poor so in cell phones as you if you open the back side of your cell phone you will find that the power dissipated power dissipating components are small and the battery is occupying a large space so the power from a smaller area needs to be spread to a large area where the uh, you know your metal screen if it is a iphone type system or samsung or others will have plastic but they use the glass as the way of dissipating heat and there you will find that it has to spread from a smaller processor that is inside to a larger area of the phone face so that spreading resistance there is one of the key bottlenecks so how to design the phone thermal solution for a phone so that heat spreads from a smaller area to a larger area becomes extremely important and it is one of the bottlenecks many people trying to come up with methods to develop new materials um, to enable the spreading for example there are natural graphites that has very high in plane spreading that is it has thermal conductivity in plane but out of the plane or through the thickness it has lower conductivity but within a given plane they have very high uh, conductivity for example in natural graphite in plane conductivity can be as high as 1500 watts per meter kelvin but through plane is only 2 or 3 watts per meter kelvin but in in cases where natural graphite can be oriented in such a way that it the distance can be improved and uh, then it becomes one of the very important materials for cell phone cooling in fact you will find some of the advanced cell phones do use graphite these as a way of spreading the heat from the processor to the backside of the fix. Whenever the heat is spreading from a smaller area to a larger area, it is called spreading resistance. If the heat is flowing from a larger area to a smaller area, it is called construction resistance. And these resistances do occur very naturally in many of the electric systems. And, and you can see that why uh, this becomes important in this example you see that there is a uniform heat source that is on top of a heat sink there there is no spreading resistance the power level dissipated by this and this are the same the power is same okay however the area over which the heat is dissipated is larger for this case and it's only 6% of this in the second case that is shown here. The power is same, but heat flux is high here, heat flux is low here. In this case, there is no spreading resistance. The area of the heat source and the area of the heat sink are same. Here, the area of the heat source is much smaller. It's only 6% of the area of the heat sink that is shown here you will see that you can have temperatures at least 1.5 that is it's higher there is a it's not shown in any units there is some normalized temperature that is shown here it's much higher 50 percent higher at least um, in this case because of the spreading resistance that comes with it So you can see some of the examples shown here uh, where you will see spreading as well as constriction resistance. So in the case of uh, you know heat source that we just discussed, going from a smaller heat source to a larger substrate, there is spreading resistance. But in some cases, the heat source it's constricted to go through a smaller area from a larger area. The example is a solder ball where 
there is a substrate here there is the motherboard here and they are connected through the solder ball the heat needs to flow from the substrate through the solder ball because air is poorly conducting but the solder balls have relatively higher thermal conductivity so it will constrict itself to go through a smaller area and then spread so here you are seeing a constriction to heat flow and then spreading that is happen happening simultaneously so one of the questions i have is what happens to the average temperature of the heat source as we change the heat source the power is same but as we go the power for this case is same 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 but the area of the heat source is decreasing from left to the right what happens to the average temperature is the average temperature going to rise i just showed you that maximum temperature is higher at least 1.5 times higher in this case this is maximum temperature this is not the average temperature if i were to calculate an average temperature will it be same or how will it change can anyone say this okay so i'll just move on uh, the average temperature will remain the same no matter what the area changes the average temperature will remain the same only the maximum temperature changes as you go to smaller areas for the same power levels the average temperature meaning area averaged temperature here okay so this is one of the aspects that i'll discuss again in the so i have given you another example here there is a small area and that is where the heat source is and this is a plate area that is much larger how do i calculate heat flux should i base it on source area or should i base it on plate area because if i use the larger area i will get smaller heat flux if i use a smaller area i'll get larger heat flux which one should i use so these type of questions typically occur in the practical problems but there is no universal answer to this because some people do report oh my the confusions arises when one says oh heat flux is 10 watts per centimeter square or meter square based on plate area and someone says it's 100 watts per meter square based on source area the only way to fix this confusion is to always show always not just the heat flux but also say where the area is so one has to define heat flux um with the specific area in mind but this never happens even in data sheets in many uh, uh, in many supplier manufacturers provide a document itself they don't tell you where they have calculated the flux and that leads to a lot of confusion sometimes so in this slide i'm trying to capture the spreading or constriction resistance uh, as it if the area one second so here i have depicted four where the the red is the heat source or your electronic chip there is a shape the black line is this is a top view that you're looking at the black line is the plate area that is this is the red if i do a cross section of this it will look like this so there is spreading resistance that is happening this is equally valid for construction as well if the heat was were to flow from this larger area into the smaller area then it becomes constriction resistance so the this this arrangement is typically common in electronics where it is often it is spreading but if you are talking about contact resistance problem then you will see that why is this not going up
One second, I'm just fixing this. There was, oh, some disturbance at my end, right? Uh, I'm sorry for that. I think the kid was crying so loudly. So here's an example where we have different shapes of the heat source as well as plate area itself. And you see that as long as I use this non dimensional parameter k times square root of AP, AP being the plate area, that is the area associated with this cross sectional area of this plate, times RC is the resistance. The resistance is de defined based on temperature, average temperature of the heat source minus average temperature of the plate divided by the power that was dissipated. That is average temperature of the heat source minus average temperature of the plate divided by the power that was dissipated by the heat source. If you use this non dimensional value and plot it as a function of AS, AS being the source area divided by AP, then you will find that there is no difference in shape or the form, or the, whether it is square or circular plate area or um, circular or square area or even rotated like a diamond that you get uniformly same perform I mean, essentially one one relationship is sufficient to capture any of this. Typically, if I look at spreading resistance, there are two resistances that one has to accommodate. One is the spreading of the heat from a smaller area to larger area. And the second one, there is a typical conduction resistance that happens in the solid itself. For example, in this solid, you will have some hot temperature to cold temperature. That means there is conduction resistance offered by this. That conduction resistance in this case will be thickness divided by thermal conductivity of the base material times in the denominator, you will have cross sectional area. That is the L by Ka that typically one features in conduction heat transfer. So that bulk resistance is what I call R bulk. And RC is the spreading resistance. So those two resistances should, should be accounted for if I want to calculate the source temperature. If I want to write a resistance network between the source temperature to the ambient temperature, then there is a resistance across this. Then there is a resistance from the heat sink if I were to mount a heat sink here. That is given by this R naught. There is external resistance. Then there is two resistances within this block itself: the bulk resistance and the spreading resistance. So, will there be an optimum thickness in this case? I have already given the answer, but there is going to be an optimum thickness uh, of the base uh, because what will happen is as you make the base thicker and thicker, you will find that the spreading resistance goes down. As you make the. But if you keep increasing the thickness beyond a point, what happens is your bulk resistance keeps increasing. I will show you in a plot soon. Um, or I'll just show it now. So if you see this. The bulk resistance, this is spreader thickness. This is the total resistance. This is a combination of bulk resistance plus the contact resistance. This yellow line represents as you increase the thickness because thickness divided by K times area of cross section is the resistance. The resistance keeps increasing. That is a linear increase. On the other hand, the contact resistance, sorry, the spreading resistance is given by this gray line. You can see that. It is very high initially for very small spreader thickness. As the spreader thickness increases, it keeps dropping because spreading resistance improves. After a point, it just becomes flat because there is no more influence of the smaller heat source on the larger plate area. 
So beyond this, if you increase it, you are just unnecessarily increasing the bulk resistance. So that means this is your optimal thickness that one has to decide. So this is one of the ways by which all this heat spreaders and others that are used in electronics are designed is to ensure that they are optimal. The, I discussed about this integrated heat spreader. That thickness needs to en ensure that the bulk resistance is not so high because you just made that uh, spreader too. So, um, <clears throat> what we'll do is that we'll take a picture and discuss some aspects of how the temperature profile, cross-sectional temperature profile looks like. What we are going to do is that this heat source, we are going to assume that to have a uniform heat source, but it is a smaller in area compared to the plate area that is much larger. And the bottom of this is some sort of a uniform heat transfer coefficient is specified. So a cross section at, along the center line like this is shown here. Heat source here Q, there is a thickness T, there is heat transfer coefficient applied at the bottom. So as you apply the heat source, you can see that the average temperature of the heat source is given by this dashed line. However, the temperature profile, as you would expect, because it's a uniform heat source, that it is peaks at the center. That is at the center of center of this uh, heat source, you see the highest temperature, that is the maximum temperature. In electronic cooling design, the, the aim is not to keep this average temperature below a certain maximum. It is actually the aim is to reduce this maximum temperature below a certain critical value, let's say 100 degrees Celsius. So, but most of our thermodynamic laws or the heat Fourier law is always written based on isothermal surfaces. For example, if I were to refer to a, a so bulk resistance of the conduction in a solid. Um, there, what you will see is that we take a block of solid, we assume that there is this one dimensional object. We assume that left side is at some hot temperature and the right side is at that cold temperature. What we mean by hot temperature and cold temperature is that the hot temperature is going to be uniform. That is, it's, it's constant, while the cold temperature is going to be uniform, that is constant. That's when we can write the formula if the block, solid block is of length L or thickness T divided and it has a cross-sectional area A and let's say this is a copper block, then copper thermal conductivity, then we write as length divided by Ka. K is the thermal conductivity of the copper, A being the cross-section, conduction cross-section area. So there, um, the inherent assumption is that the boundaries are at uniform temperatures. Okay, but what happens in electronics is that now you have a maximum temperature that is different, that is of interest to us to keep below a certain maximum, but the average temperature is where you can write the resistance. So this excess temperature rise also needs to be captured and, and this is where many of the problems exists in the industry or as well as in uh, academia in some cases in journal papers as well is that people write resistance from this maximum which is at one point to this average temperature or to a, a fluid that is ambient temperature that is let's say T naught. That resistance is not thermodynamically correct because it is not isothermal. It is not happening over the whole area. It is happening at one point in that area. So that type of errors should be avoided. To, otherwise, this becomes a major challenge because you will never find energy balance when you do that. And, but it is quite common and you will see many such errors in the journal papers and in some of the industry magazines you will find that people write uh, resistance using apples and oranges, which becomes 
um, challenge to understand what they really mean by that. So anyhow, you will see that heat source has its own average temperature. Heat source has its own maximum temperature. Similarly, because the spreader has is not correctly optimized. If the spreader was correctly optimized, what you will find is that this temperature, the maximum temperature and the average temperature will become almost identical. But in this case, the spreader thickness is not optimized. So what is happening is that there is still um, the average temperature is shown here as dash line, but the spread this the the temperature profile of the spreader at this point at the bottom plane still has some certain maximum temperature at the centroid because the spread heat has not spread uniformly. So that uh, should be avoided and it should be carefully designed and so on. Okay. Finally, before I close off today's discussion, um, I want to talk about one important aspect, which is the coupling between the heat transfer coefficient that is here on the bottom side. There is a heat source here, there is a certain spreader here, and there is a heat transfer coefficient here. There is a very classical coupling that is happening between spreading resistance from a heat source to the larger base. If the spreading resistance is not completely, if the spreading resistance is not completely taken care in a material thickness, because you can't in, in electronic cooling uh, or any actual product dimension, this thickness cannot be arbitrarily chosen to our convenience because the system, if I look at a cell phone, if I make my cell phone, currently the cell phones are only four or five mm thickness or even less than that, in fact, so if I want to make it 10 mm because I want to spread the heat, nobody will accept it because they're saying this is bulky. I can't keep it in my pocket or some such thing will cry. So the thickness cannot be increased beyond a certain point. In such cases, the heat spreading resistance actually couples with the heat transfer coefficient. And I'll show you that and depending on the thermal conductivity. There are three plots shown here. One is a material called LTCC. LTCC stands for low temperature co-fired ceramic. This is a ceramic. There is silicon. And then there is copper. So let's look at the LTCC. Um, so what is shown is average temperature of the heat source minus ambient temperature divided by the power divided power dissipated by the heat source. That is what is shown as R thermal on this axis, vertical axis. On the horizontal axis is heat transfer coefficient. One has to understand what heat transfer coefficient meaning here. It's this is a log plot. You can see 10 power zero. That means one watts per meter square Kelvin. This is 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000, and so on. So 10 power zero is one and one to five is typically natural convection cooled. That is the typical number for when you are when you have natural convection cooled system, then your heat transfer coefficient is on the order of one to five watts per minute square Kelvin. Beyond five to 10, even 25, you need to use a fan. Fan, that means you are now adding cost to the system. You are now on addition to uh, fan. Now you have to move the fan. You are putting power cost in the form of fan, and you have to. You are also putting power to the fan. That means the system is becoming inefficient. Then, if I go from 25 watts, then I have to mount a heatsink. If I want to go beyond 20 watts per meter square meter square Kelvin uh, heat transfer coefficient, I need to put heatsinks. That means you are adding more cost to it, and heatsinks put certain amount of pressure drop as well. That means the power consumed by the fan also increases. Then beyond 100 or so, air cooling is not sufficient. Until now, I've, I've been assuming air cooled. I have to use, start using liquid water cooled systems. 10 power three is single phase water cooled, roughly speaking, at the best case. That is 1,000 watts per meter square Kelvin. Beyond 10 power three, then I have to use two phase systems. So there is boiling or exchange happening there. 
so you you see that each of these mean that you are adding more and more cost to the system and your r thermal is not decreasing in this case let's look at the thickness of 1 mm <coughs> so it's our total thermal is starting from some 120 or so and drops off and moving even from a single phase cooling to a two phase cooling there is not much change you are just barely changing this the resistance is dropping but it is changing so so improving the cooling solution you have put in so much cost in it and still there is no improvement to the cooling that is the thermal resistance is not coming down uh, significantly in that case what is happening is the spreading resistance is controlling the system in in this case and we can show that um, that bulk resistance because it's only thickness divided by ka and k of the ltcc is on the order of 3 watts per meter kelvin so uh, you will see that any improvement in the thickness uh, is not, just not helping. So if you have smaller thickness, it's even more evident that this is even the um, asymptotic regime quickly. So what this says is that spreading resistance and heat transfer coefficient, heat transfer coefficient, the value of heat transfer coefficient means a lot. It means either you're using fan, you're using pump or two phase flow, what if, whatever so you can see see similar type of information here as well in this case you see that on, even at single phase flow of water is causing issues but when you use slightly better thermally conducting material like silicon or copper this knee where it changes uh, where it reaches asymptotic region shifts from 10 power 3 to silicon for 10 power 4 and to 10 power 5 for copper so Using higher thermal conductivity material always helps, as you will know very well. But the problem is that sometimes you can't use it. LTCC is a material that is often used in power electronics, where you have no choice but to use LTCC-based materials there in the substrate level. So in, in such cases, this is a very important conclusion, is that now the spreading resistance coupling between heat transfer coefficient should be understood well. So I'll I'll there is a very simple model you can develop, but I'll skip all those things at, at this point. And in the next um, class, which is tomorrow, I'll try to do a, an analytical solution on board. Um, and uh, for now, I'll close off with uh, what are the ways to reduce uh, spreading resistance. Typically, one of the ways that um, people use to reduce um, spreading resistance is that if you look at the problems associated with spreading resistance you will see more uniform temperature when the spreading resistance is zero as uh, as we've been talking about this is same true for constriction resistance as well but as the areas of the plate and the source match closer or the ratio ratio of area of the source to plate is one then spreading resistance is almost negligible having this heat source the location of the heat source is also important. Instead of having the heat source at the center, if I move that heat source to the corner like this, then the increase in um, the thermal resistance is almost 40% higher. If I move it to other corner, then the spreading resistance problem becomes even worse. It actually, from this case of having the heat source at the center to this case of having it at the corner, it is twice high, higher resistance compared to this. So the option that typically one says is that there's a very big layout design uh, in, uh, in many of these uh, electronics cooling places where people ask the electrical engineers to move the heat source from the corner to the center because that gives you a lot less spreading resistance or even spread the heat instead of having four different sources, you make it small, four different sources. And these are the trends of, this is single core architecture, and this is the many core or the multi-core architecture that where you see number of cores that are logic units that are dissipating high power. So, the, the, so those are the ways, and as I already discussed with you, uh, there is an optimum thickness to the spreaders, and that is need to be, a, every single problem needs to be numerically analyzed to obtain um, a thickness that enables 
uh, reduces spreading resistance to a constant value and also keeps the bulk resistance to a certain uh, values. Okay, I will stop here and uh, in uh, just one, one other item. Uh, there are some calculators that are available online from University of Waterloo. Um, those are, uh, you can just put the values for the different systems they have, and you should be able to calculate thermal uh, spreading resistance and construction resistance from their calculators. However, one big point of um, caution is that many of these approximate analytical solutions provide you insight into the problem, but they are they should be used carefully and one always uses software like ANSYS or others to actually determine the real uh, contact, uh, spreading or contact as a construction resistance. So um, I will stop at this point and I will discuss few things um, course itself. Um, so until now, in uh, so this website, this Moodle uh, Fossey, were you able to log in and uh, any issues with that? Okay, thank you for. Okay, um, so because the reason is whether you like uh, some other mode of communication, um, because I will be posting all my information on the Moodle itself for you to download, um, like the, the materials and so on, the today's discussion materials and so on. And uh, the videos will also become available at later point, the QIP coordinators. Um, that I don't know. Um, is there a is there anything else that preferred mode of anything else you have questions about this course or what would you like to see? Is there any comment input at this point? I think uh, I have to check with the QIP coordinators regarding access to the video recordings. While I am recording the videos as we are speaking, um, and I will be sharing it to the QIP coordinators. How they uh, handle it, I don't know. Um, but I will be recording. I'm recording these, and I will be giving it to them. And uh, we can't upload it on Moodle because Moodle doesn't have this space for handling these big videos. Um, the videos, um, let me what their plan is, and uh, in uh, probably not tomorrow, because tomorrow is a Sunday, I don't know whether they respond. Um, so if feasible, I will try to put it on Google Drive, or if they themselves are doing it in some form, I will find out and let you know. So I will convey that by Monday or Tuesday by uh, Moodle message. Yes, the videos at some point should be should become available. Um, is uh, I don't know. Uh, I just assume that you you all teach e-transfer. Um, but that may be a bad assumption on my part. Uh, can you please confirm that the content, because I'm making certain assumptions when I'm discussing some of these things, and it actually becomes much, uh, much more involved uh, lectures as we proceed. Um, the force convection and all will become a little bit more involved. So um, let me know if there are things that you want me to slow down or you want me to pay attention to, then I will do, do so. 
So thanks for mentioning that. I'm actually in the electronics department. So mm. would you suggest I, um, you know, brush up something or read up something before coming to the next uh, lectures? Yes. Yeah, so, so mostly um, what I am trying to do is uh, convert this, all the thermal into some sort of a resistance network type thing. And uh, so if you can brush up on the the spice type documents where there is a electrical circuit representation, uh, um, you know, in terms of I'll probably post some ideas on, you know, for example, what is a conductive resistance? What is conduction resistance? Radiation resistance? Those type of um, uh, brush up will be very useful. Otherwise, uh, um, I will try to mix up with boards as well. Today, I didn't set up my camera. I have a board behind me. In the next class, I'll try to write those expressions as well, as much as feasible. But it may be useful to study a chapter on electronic schooling. Um, um, you know, that is also available on some of the books you know, online itself. Um, um, where they specifically have inputs about how how uh, heat transfer coefficient or what it what it means uh, and how do I write a resistance uh, based on that? There are some um, subtle differences between thermal resistance and uh, the heat transfer resistance, thermal resistance and the electrical resistance. For example, um, you know we have V equal to I R. Um, in a Ohm's law, but in Fourier's law, where the voltage is treated as the temperature difference, the voltage difference is treated, and the current is heat flux. Um, so the resistance doesn't carry the same message as a Ohm's law will carry, which is, um, you know, if I try to do match the units, they won't match. The current, what I mean, is usually written in terms of wattage or and the, the voltage difference is written in terms of kelvins or degree celsius so you'll have kelvin by watt on the other hand there you will see um, volt by amps so this wattage and kelvins and all these things get mixed up so it, it is not a really a one-to-one -one matching even though there is similarities between ohm's law and uh, and the Fourier's law that we use. So, um, <clears throat> so that those type of uh, background, little bit of a brush up, uh, will indeed help. I think. I know I gave a very long answer. Yeah. No. No. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, is the at least the sense the same in the sense that if we have a higher electrical resistance, mm. it means that to get a, a given amount of current, we need to put more voltage. Um, mm. At least that sense carry through also in this thermal yes, resistance. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I will see that if I put more current in this case, more heat flux, I will see increased temperature rise. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I, there are two. Uh, items for me, I'll uh, communicate through Moodle or if they respond to me to, by today, I'll respond to you regarding videos, how to post them uh, by tomorrow or maybe in the uh, Monday, Tuesday time frame. Okay. And uh, this lecture materials, the PowerPoints and stuff, that I will upload through Moodle because there is no space constraints for that small file. But these videos tend to become megabytes and megabytes and maybe even sometimes gigabytes because it's a three hour class that um, I will find out whether it is YouTube or Google Drive, whichever way I will let you know. Okay. Um, if there is nothing else, uh, maybe we'll talk again tomorrow. And tomorrow I'll, I will try to do it on the board some of the derivations and uh, maybe you can uh, just to have a mix up. Otherwise, this becomes monotonous to keep talking using a slides and that's not quite useful as well. Um, I'll try to do that tomorrow.
Thank you.